I'm a social activist and a feminist, but specifically working on um, the issue of female genital mutilation, which sometimes is called FGM. The community or the area of the world I'm from, which is North Somalia, um, which is the Horn of Africa, it's up to 98%. So sometimes we just, we don't necessarily even need to speak. We just know that a lot of us have been through the experience. It's a horrible thing, but it's something that I'm very positive that we can end. I was living here in the UK and we were on a holiday at the time and um, basically the war had, had broken out in what, what, what is now Somaliland so we were coming back to the UK. My FGM happened completely out of context so I had the FGM but I was freely educated. I wasn't forced to like, you know, be religious. I wasn't told that I couldn't do what boys could do. I was given, I was given no boundaries or no kind of um, limits on my ambition. That was one of the main reasons why I never spoke out for over 20 years because I thought, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not a poor African girl. I don't want people to be thinking of me as this, this victim. I just kind of forgot about it. I thought people, do you know what? It's not my place as a child to keep pushing people and having this conversation. And then in 2006, I, met, I went to a school in Bristol. I met these young girls who could have been me, could have been my siblings, um, wanted to talk about FGM. And I thought, what do you guys know about FGM? It's 2006. It's like, obviously it's not, because it was no longer a conscious thing or a evident thing in my life. And there was 14 of those girls and 13 of them had had FGM. And then I remember it was like, you know, in that moment that my silence was complicit because everybody was still thinking that it didn't happen in the UK. It was all to do with culture. It was, it wasn't like, so all these are the kind of misconceptions. The main thing was to kind of get the, like, the public services, the government, those with duty of care to understand that these are as British girls as anybody else. And that in letting them down, that was a complete and utter unacceptable failure. It was that whole thing of just starting small and protecting one girl. Because for me, that girl was very symbolically my niece who has the same surname as me. And I thought, okay, it could end within a generation. She could be the fourth in our line. So my grandmother, my mother, myself. Number four doesn't have to be cut. From now on, there is no FGM evidence within our family. Like practice, like the active practice of FGM. It went from 100% to zero in one generation. So it's about making this video, it's about sharing a tweet, it's about doing something. Each and every one of us has a role to play in, in, in ensuring that a child is like, you know, saved from FGM. And once you save one child, you save a whole generation. I really want girls to get to an age where if someone says to them, like, you know, FGM is going to make you cleaner, FGM is going to make you this, they're like, oh, for God's sake, that's so ridiculous, and walk away from the whole kind of um, conversation. But I know when we're not there yet, we're not there yet.